I'm uh, very excited here this afternoon to actually address uh, one of my favorite questions that's coming up and I get asked this a lot. So what is the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? I'm actually not going to answer this question directly today, but hopefully after my talk, every one of you will start to form some opinion about it. So we live in the golden age of machine learning, and it's very exciting to see how we continue making news, breaking boundaries. Vision being the first domain that uh, I would argue we conquered it. Uh, now machine learning has achieved uh, supernatural abilities uh, to track, identify, and uh, um, you know, essentially just uh, follow any object that comes uh, within our view of vision. And the next domain that we start conquering is in language. Now computer machine translations are capable of translating text across several hundred language. We have machines capable of generating new content and also just generating live captions as I speak. My personal favorite, of course, is AlphaFold 2, which was announced last year. And not only did it essentially essentially solve this grand challenge in biology of predicting protein folding, it actually ushered in a exciting new age of machine learning aided drug and material discovery, which you can imagine will just accelerate all sorts of progress. So it's almost magical what we can achieve in machine learning. But uh, I hate to say this, uh, unfortunately, the magic here is very, very expensive for specialized hardware and data. Lots, lots, lots of data, as my colleague Sujit already pointed at. In fact, right now we're in this trend of what we call the so-called large data, large model trend. As um, transformer models first gets popular in the early 2018s, you can see this trend show here in this graph. And the last example being recently this week announced the Megatron Turing model by Microsoft. By Microsoft, this model have 520 trillion, uh, 500 billion parameters. Just let that sink in for a little bit. And also, I want to draw your attention to this red line. Don't let it deceive you. It looks straight and linear. If you pay attention to the web access, you realize that uh, it's exponential growth. Uh, if you think about uh, the kind of resources goes in training one of these uh, models, uh, it's not achievable by just any entity. And uh, if we continue this trend, we literally are going to run out of resources on Earth training these large models. And uh, you know what? Uh, as we invest so heavily in all these uh, machine learning models, uh, not always well, it's not very hard to actually find examples where machine learning just uh, fall flat short. Uh, so in this example that came out by Freeland in 2012, uh, they proposed a set of synthetic visual reasoning tests. Uh, the test is uh, very simple and you can essentially break it into two categories uh, um, of uh, essentially procedurally generated uh, images, um, you can think about uh, the problems that come in two tabs. One is the sameness difference. So on the first image on the left side, uh, you can see that uh, the two shapes are actually the same shape. It's just translated. So this is the sameness class. The, uh, the one below it, it will be a difference class. The two shapes are actually different uh, invariant of transformation. Uh, the ones, the next two on the first row is uh, what we call uh, relation, spatial relationship. Uh, the smaller image is inside the large shape. Uh, and then the one next to it, it's also a spatial relationship. Uh, the lined in a uh, in the straight line. As it turned out, uh, the machine learning models that can perform perfectly identify spatial relationships uh, performs rather poorly at some problems, even at a chance, identifying sameness and a different type of problems. So let this sink in for a little bit. So sameness and difference. This is uh, really 
basic intrinsic concept. It's not new. It's not like a concept that only human can grasp. In fact, um, even honeybee can. So in this behavioral study done by Weber and O in 2013, they actually tested the honeybee on this thing called delayed matching on seminus. They use a Y-shaped maze that has three gates. The honeybee would enter the maze through the stem of the Y on one gate and have to choose to exit the maze on the arm of the Y. Specifically, these gates are either coded by color or shapes. And in this case, they first train the honeybees to follow, to enter the maze with, say, yellow color gate, and then choose to leave the maze with another yellow color gate that would lead to food, so thus matching on sameness. After they successfully trained the honeybees to do that, they switched the gate to actually striations or patterns. The same honeybee can be trained with very few examples. Again, grasp on the sameness idea of following, for example, two, uh, two horizontal striped uh, gates to lead to fruit. So honeybee can do this. Machine learning, not so great. Uh, well, what can we do? Since the inception of machine learning, we always take uh, inspiration from biology and the perceptron is uh, after all modeled uh, based on biological neurons. So to that extent, uh, our group actually collaborated with uh, Gabe's group in trying to understand uh, how dynamics and uh, layout or, or geometry really influences a network's ability to learn and the capacity to learn. So to this extent, uh, we implemented some realistic uh, dynamics, for example, inhibition and excitatory neurons, uh, activation threshold, weight decay, refractory period, uh, internal propagation delays, and the spike time independent uh, plasticity. Uh, as far as the network architecture, goes so we have an array of uh, ranging from random like error screens to stochastic block model to regular click grid lattice to some biological inspired layouts like uh, connectomes of C elegance and morphological lattice. Our results are both um, promising and puzzling. Promising in the, I'm going to show you the first video is what I categorize as promising. In this video, we, uh, we use a random initialized network and the stimulus we use are MNIST digits, which are 28 by 28 black and white digitized handwritten like digits. Um, we sent the stimulus through this network and then we took the activation path embedded using a method called pass to vac and then we um, PCA down to three dimensions just for visualization. Here you can say that uh, you can see that the activation path actually corresponds with the stimulus classes very nicely. In fact, that uh, when we visualize it, uh, you can see this uh, dark brown, um, like a dark brown patch on the top that uh, corresponds to class one. And then this, uh, for example, purple patch here corresponds uh, to class two, I believe. Uh, However, what we mostly run into is actually this is second uh, scenario where we just randomly stimulate 20% of the nodes and then you will see the both blue and orange uh, edges. The blue are excitatory, orange are inhibitory. As you can see, as the simulation just goes through a couple iterations, uh, soon it gets to the state that uh, the network is saturated, it's very chaotic, uh, and uh, we don't actually know how to analyze this. It's almost akin to giving someone seizure. And uh, as we explore more and more of these uh, um, neurodynamic inspired model, what we realize is that uh, the search parameter space is really large and it's not linear, which means that uh, we can't just hand to one parameter and expect everything to work. Uh, we really need somehow a way to guide us uh, to find uh, how to tune and even initialize these things. And that's uh, where Ellison and uh, his wonderful for organoid uh, came into place. Uh I don't have to tell anyone in this uh, panel about how wonderful these organoids are, not only because uh, 
after a certain level of development, they start to manifest these population uh, white uh, synchronous behavior. But this is really the first time we have a brain miniature brain model that we can Organ, we can observe how it grows, we can study, we can actually start measuring its internal activities. So to this extent, uh, actually um, Francesca in Ellison's lab started pioneering this uh, technique about uh, constructing an effective network based on activities measured at the different uh, sensor locations uh, in multi-electric array and uh, using this uh, correlation and the delays to build a graph. And what uh, we end up doing is constructing a time series of a graph based on these activities. So what uh, you see here on the right side, uh, uh, some examples of this uh, graph, they actually represent a snapshot of growth in this organoid development period. What is really awesome about this graph set, uh, it's actually a domain that uh, us computer scientists understand and uh, can study. And also what's also fascinating about these graph sets, it uh, might not necessarily represent the physical connectome, but in the effectiveness, it's a way for us to start understanding representations or embeddings of how they manifest. And just a word about um, embeddings or representations. Uh, here I actually showed six different representations of the same underlying graph structure. In this case, is a Bing user search graph specifically in electronic devices. And uh, we actually even color coded uh, the type of the device that the Bing user is searching. The data is the same. And as you can see that uh, the representation is completely different. And with these different types of representation, they actually have a different purpose. In the uh, case of a Bing user um, a search graph, we use uh, combining multiple of these representation actually using a method called linear integer programming so, to help us better understand what the user search for and uh, respond with search queries. But they're not just useful actually in uh, Bing or web search. In the bottom example, we actually have a um, connectome that's constructed uh, by our collaborators in Cambridge of Professor Drosophila Lave. This is a very detailed connectome that it's not just mapping out how the cells or neurons are connected, but it goes to subcellular. It maps out parts of the neurons that's connecting. So you can see connections of exon to dendrite or dendrite to dendrite likewise. With that sub neuronal level connections, we're able to construct four different representations or four different graphs. And uh, when we started um, trying to figure out uh, how or which representations are better, that's when we could tie to what we need to do. And in the case of we're trying to find all the mushroom body input, uh, um, input of motor neurons, uh, we actually find that by combining all these representations, that's what gives us the best results. So I talked about uh, where machine learning fell short uh, and how we take inspiration from uh, biology and uh, organoids, for example, are really helpful for us to understand uh, compute and the uh, development changes and its uh, effect on abilities to learn. And uh, now I'm going to circle back to this thing that I originally started with, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so I don't think I'm qualified uh, to define intelligence, artificial or otherwise. Uh, but uh, what uh, my colleague like Sujis uh, and uh, among others uh, and I have come up with is uh, a list of desirable traits, uh, what we would like our AI to be able to do. And as Sujis already talked about, foremost, we'd like it to be efficient. Biological organism has to function in very limited, resource limited situation, so should our AI. And uh, then it also has to have the ability to generalize. If uh, I learn to identify cats inside my house, I better be able to identify cats outside my house, otherwise that skill is very 
limited. Uh, and uh, if I understand about the sameness difference uh, by being able to visually tell two subjects apart, uh, I should be able to understand the same concept of sameness difference when it comes to auditory, tactile, or olfactory. Then, you know, like, uh, some higher cognitive abilities, uh, reasonings, uh, something that uh, I never encountered, I should be able to say that I don't know, which is also very basic. Then relationships of things that's larger or smaller, or even causal, if I drop a pen, it will fall. Last but not least, if we want our AI to help improve our life and uh, help us make, guide us make decisions, uh, we better understand why it's making those type of suggestions. And that's why it has to be explainable. So how do we achieve all that? And I uh, hope by now I have convinced everyone that it's not about uh, building the most expensive cluster, gathering the largest data set and uh, train the biggest model. What I believe is that we have to do this side by side with biology by actually designing a set of experiments that can be run all the way from organoids uh, to fly to uh, zebrafish and human. And, uh, the this uh, set of tests uh, have to be invariant uh, to language and uh, also knowledge bias. Uh, the purpose for this uh, set of tests is to quantify how biological capabilities align the five axes that I talked about. Uh, but more importantly, it's actually for us to observe this learning process, but uh, also pragmatically using a measurement uh, to quantify learning and the progress as the Suji's already alluded to, for example, using information bottleneck. Only when we can understand how learning occurs and quantify these things, we can really start taking inspirations uh, from natural intelligence, from biological organisms to improve our AI. So this is what we propose as a collective alternate approach to solving the intelligence problem. Mm -hmm.